Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting in 2018 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I please make sh ask you all to make sure that your mobile phones are on silent. No apologies have been received, so we'll move straight on to agenda item one, which is uh, in relation to Ofcom. The Scottish Parliament has a formal consultative role in the setting the st strategic priorities of Ofcom. And the committee will now explore Ofcom's proposed annual plan for 2018 and its annual report. I'd welcome from Ofcom Glenn Preston, the Scotland Director, Gary Clemo, the Connected Nations Project Director, Jonathan Ruff, the author of Connected Nations Scotland 2017, and Matthew Bourne, the annual plan team. Now, Glenn, I think you are going to make an opening statement. So if, if, you, if you'd like to make one, please, please start away. Thank you very much, Convener. Yes, just for, for two or three minutes. You've actually done, you've done my first two or three paragraphs, which was introducing my, uh, my colleagues. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'll focus a bit on the annual plan uh, and uh, some of the key elements of Connected Nations, um, and then we look forward to, to the conversation with the committee. Um, it is a statutory consultation. We're obligated to, uh, to do this annually. Um, it closes this Friday, so we do welcome the opportunity to have the conversation with the committee uh, about Ofcom's uh, strategic priorities for 2018-19. Uh, we have had a consultation event in Edinburgh. We did that on the 18th of January, which was really well attended from across the sectors that we regulate. We had somewhere between 40 and, 40 and 50 people there. Uh, we covered the full range of Ofcom business, so supporting network investment, ensuring markets work for consumers, uh, securing standards in broadcasting, uh, and we did do a December session uh, with the Culture Committee where we covered uh, our interests, particularly in the BBC. Um, understanding convergence and market changes uh, and also adapting to regulatory change uh, following the passage of the Digital Economy Act uh, in the UK Parliament last, last year. Uh, we hope to publish the plan by the end of March uh, and we will reflect the engagement that we've done across the UK, including in Edinburgh, uh, and the formal responses we get from stake stakeholders across Scotland. Uh, it's worth adding that in respect of Scotland in particular, the draft plan recognises the provision of fixed broadband, mobile uh, and postal services that meet the needs of consumers uh, and SMEs in particular in rural and remote areas continues to present particular challenges. Uh, and we'll no doubt get into this in discussion, but on fixed broadband, we expect to be given responsibility for implementation of the UK government's regulatory universal service obligation in the coming weeks. Uh, we think the legislation is due to be laid uh, in the UK Parliament by the end of this month. Uh, and once we're clear on the final terms of that, we'll work, uh, as we have been along the way, with the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust on the relationship with their own Reaching 100 programme. Uh, the evidence session that you did last week with the Cabinet Secretary and Scottish Government officials was extremely beneficial to us in helping our understanding about the direction of travel on that programme as well. Uh, on mobile, we're reaching the point of consulting on future awards of spectrum bands as they're cleared and released. We've touched a bit on this at our previous session last April and in between, particularly on the 700 megahertz band. Uh, this will cover the design of auctions, uh, any obligations and measures to promote competition as part of the license awards. Um, and that will include us working very, very closely with the Scottish Government on its own 4G infill programme, which is of direct relevance to some of the work we'll be doing on, on spectrum auctions. Uh, and on post, the committee will have seen the significant cross-party and cross-parliamentary interest in the issue of surcharging over recent months. Uh, we're continuing to engage with stakeholders across the UK on our findings on the causes and effects. Uh, and our consumer group director, Lindsay Fussell, will be giving evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee of the UK Parliament on this subject, uh, alongside Citizens Advice Scotland and Trading Standards on the 27th of February. Um, very briefly on Connected Nations, um, as you know, it's a report that's an in-depth look at communications networks and infrastructure across the UK. Uh, we recognise how important that data is to policymakers, industry and consumers. Uh, and you mentioned already, Convener, that we did publish uh, a Scotland-specific report uh, on the 15th of December 2017. Uh, what that shows is that coverage has increased significantly in recent years, but there are still many areas where broadband speeds are inadequate and mobile coverage is lacking. And this is most acutely felt in the rural areas of Scotland, which committee members will be, will be all too well aware of. Um, just to close, Convener, and you mentioned this in your opening remarks, um, the memorandum, memorandum of understanding that we work to in terms of our engagement with the Scottish Parliament and uh, Scottish and UK governments contains provisions relating to the appointment of an Ofcom board member for Scotland, which we have touched on in the past. 
Uh, I'm pleased to say that the first Ofcom board member for Scotland was formally appointed by Scottish ministers last week. Uh, Bob Downs, who's also the current chair of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, formally took up the role on the 1st of February. Uh, the appointee has the same UK-wide responsibilities as other non-executive members of Ofcom, uh, but the MOU requires the role to be capable of representing the interests of citizens and consumers uh, of Scotland. My team in Scotland will be working closely with the new board member over the coming weeks and months to support their engagement with uh, the government, uh, all levels of government, with parliament, with industry and wider civic Scotland to ensure we're properly representing Scottish citizens and consumers' interests at a strategic decision-making level in Ofcom. And I will close there, convener. Thank you very much. Um, now, I know you've all done this before, uh, but there'll be a series of questions from, from the members. If I could ask you to catch my eye, if you'd individually like to say something, and I'll, I'll try and bring you all in at the relevant point. Um, once you've caught my eye and you'd, you start speaking, could I ask you not then to look away? Because I may want to keep the meeting moving, and uh, I may indicate to you to, to, to bring what you're saying, that section, to a close. So. It's just a question of managing it, but you'll all get a chance of it. So we'll just push straight on then. Mike, I think you've got the first question. Thank, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. I'm, I'm going to focus my questioning on um, how Ofcom is pursuing its promotion of competition in Scotland. And, you know, there is a s significant gap between what is of often promised by providers and what is the reality that consumers face in their homes. Often people are sold promises of certain speeds by providers and it's not reflected in what they receive. So what can Ofcom do to ensure that real speeds are a better match to what consumers think they're purchasing? Jonathan. Um, thank you for the question, firstly. Um, so Ofcom's starting point has, has always been that competition is the best means of mm -hmm. delivering good <coughs> outcomes for consumers in terms of price, quality, um, service uh, and choice. Um, while this has delivered improvements in Scotland in recent years, as we've highlighted in the Connected Nations report, um, I think it's, it's important to, to recognise and we, we're acutely aware that competition hasn't delivered uh, the best outcomes for consumers in rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, that said, regula regulatory solutions alone are unlikely to, to drive infrastructure investment in some of the most rural areas of Scotland. Um, and so Ofcom's view is, and we highlight this in the annual plan, that it probably be necessary for government interventions of, of some kind there. Um, and there's also a role for industry to, to examine how they approach these issues. Um, so as we've highlighted in the Connected Nations report, um, we feel that genuine collaboration and constructive dialogue between industry regulators and UK and or Scottish Government uh, is the best means of, of delivering good outcomes there. Or on your specific point about mm. broadband speeds, um, and I think it's in one of the chapters under protecting consumers, um, one of the most important changes that we've put in place is to revise the broadband speeds code of practice, which uh, some of you are probably aware of. Um, in short, that involves strengthening uh, the information, well, making it clearer the information at the point of sale to consumers. Uh, we appreciate, obviously, that doesn't always um, translate into to faster speeds, and so we have put in place mechanisms to allow consumers to exit their contract if they feel they're not getting the speeds that are being delivered. Um, in terms of improving speeds more generally, and we can touch on this, I'm sure, later in the session, there's uh, various initiatives that we are supporting uh, with the UK government and the Scottish government. Um, but the most important change there, I think, is, is related to the broadband speeds code of practice. Mm -hmm. But I mean, on, on that specific point about broadband speed, so often it's, uh, we offer a speed up to such and such. Yeah. And then we find that loads of consumers don't get that speed. And when a consumer is trying to make a choice uh, as to what broadband provider they can use, Often, you can have a situation where uh, a consumer wants to have a higher speed because it says up to and actually pays more money for it and then finds actually <laughs> they're not getting as good a service as they had from a different provider. Um, how, how are Ofcom tackling that? So in, in terms of the information at the point of sale, uh, as mm -hmm. I've said, the, the Broadband Speeds Code of Practice does have some provisions there around... Such, such as? Uh, well, it's strength... Well, it, Primarily, it's, it's an advertising point, and that 
lies with Adver Advertising Standards Agency, and they have uh, recently um, put out, I think it was uh, changing the rules about speeds of up to 10% of uh, advertising. You, you have to, it has to be within a 10% uh, margin of, of the speed okay. advertised. So, okay, so primarily it's, it's an advertising okay. issue, but um, as I said, the, there are provisions in place in the code of practice to allow people to exit if they aren't getting the speeds that they were yeah. promised. Before you go on to your next question, there are a couple of other members who want to talk about specifically broadband speed. So if, if you want to push broadband speed, I'm happy to okay, give you no, another no, question. Or, 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 well, can I bring the other members yeah, in, on, particularly yeah. on broadband speed? First of all, I'd like to bring in Stuart, and then I'm going to bring in Colin. Just to be clear, it's not speed. It's specifically something that uh, Mr. Ruff said. It, it, it appeared you were suggesting that competition was about the provision of infrastructure. And I think it's probably recognised that in very small rural exchanges, I'm connected to one with 80 customers. That's not going to happen. Uh, but are you also taking an interest in the provision of um, competition at the delivery of services over the infrastructure that's there provided by someone else, which broadly means open reach? Because I think, I think that's an issue for many rural areas. Having, I mean, I know in my exchange that um, on standard connection, there are three providers. Uh, whereas in the city centre, there will be a very substantially larger number of people I might be able to go to. So therefore it becomes a price issue. So what are Ofcom doing to assist ensuring that there are multiple options that a consumer can pursue? Because consumers are not interested in infrastructure per se. They're interested in the price they pay and the service they get. So what is Ofcom doing, particularly for rural areas in that regard? Um, so firstly, I, I do accept the point that in rural areas, um, the choices are, are more limited. And yep. I, I take your point that the infrastructure investment is probably not the most catchy consumer-friendly language. Um, in the annual plan, we have, um, specifically in relation to open reach, put in provisions which we feel would incentivise a competition on the open reach network. So that is um, the term issue is legal separation. And so the idea there is that OpenReach uh, now has to treat all its wholesale customers, whether that be Sky, TalkTalk, uh, PlusNet, whichever uh, commerce providers using the OpenReach network, um, to treat them all equally. Um, so it disincentivizes them from prioritizing BT. Do forgive me, Anna, but very briefly, how will you know you've succeeded? You know, have you a measure for success uh, in competition, in particular in rural areas? That's it, convenient. So on the open reach point specifically, we have, as I said, put in place a legal separation and in the annual plan we, we allude to how we intend to measure that. We've set up a, a monitoring unit within Ofcom. I still appreciate early days, but the plan is to, um, I, th I think it's fair to say so far there's been good progress in that, but we we'll intend to monitor that over the course, course of the forthcoming year. Okay, um, Stuart, you sort of have stolen Colin's, one of Colin's questions from later. So I'm going to bring Colin in with, with his question on, on, on speeds, and I'll, I'll maybe get Jonathan to comment and Glenn on that. So, Colin, if you'd like to question on that, so, that Thank speed. you very much, convener. Scotland obviously has a, a high proportion of exchange only lines, and, and that obviously has a major impact on speeds. Can I ask how Ofcom <coughs> are helping to improve generally broadband speeds in, in rural Scotland? Because we have a, a situation where around 20% of of premises and, and, and rural local authorities uh, don't have speeds above 24 megabytes per second. So, so what are you doing to improve in general speeds um, in rural Scotland and in particular those served by uh, copper telephone lines? Um, so, so perhaps my, my colleague Gary could uh, uh, give you the, uh, the technical side of, of exchange only lines but, but in short um, obviously a lot of rural areas uh, are served by exchange only cabinets. That means that they cannot be uh, adequately upgraded to, to super fast speeds. Um, there's a more general point, I guess, around what Ofcom is, is doing to, to promote uh, delivery of faster speeds in rural areas. Um, obviously, there's the universal service obligation, so we, we share the UK government's ambition for everyone to have a decent broadband service, and that is, has been defined as 10 megabits per second download speed and one megabit per second upload speed. Um, that is currently 
well, we are currently waiting on the secondary legislation being laid at the UK Parliament. Um, so we'll have a formal role there. Um, in parallel to that, obviously, and this was touched on your, your committee session last week, the Scottish Government has its own <coughs> uh, broadband rollout programmes, the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, um, and obviously now the Reaching 100% programme. Uh, it's worth saying that Ofcom doesn't have a formal role in these programmes, but we are acutely aware of the fact that both these programmes are overlapping and we've engaged uh, quite extensively with the Scottish Government on, uh, on how that will be implemented and how we can factor that into to our own universal service obligation duties. Jonathan, I'm going to yeah. stop you on the R100 programme because there are other questions yeah, on I that and, and, yeah. and I can see this meeting is going to be interesting in, in the sense that it, it, it's going to move around a fair bit. Uh, between wh wh where, where I'm trying to take it as far as questions are concerned. Glenn, do you want to come in, or, or, or does Gary want to come in to explain the, the technicalities of it? Uh, I, Glenn, do you, should we bring in Gary first and then come back to you? Gary. Uh, it's, it's just really to say that, that recognising that, that Scotland does uh, have a larger proportion of exchange only lines than uh, other uh, nations of the UK. Um, and technically, there's not a straightforward solution to, uh, to improving the situation for consumers on exchange-only lines. Uh, OpenReach does have a program in place to explore ways to, uh, to essentially upgrade those lines. They, they can't be upgraded in the same way that, that other um, uh, properties that aren't connected directly to the exchange can be upgraded. So this, to be honest, is less about, less about the technical solution and it's more about the, the practicality of, of, the, of OpenReach uh, pursuing its programme called Copper Realignment Programme, Rearrangement Programme. And what they've found so far is that uh, each, it, it's uh, um, on an exchange by exchange basis, essentially, that, that they, can, uh, they can improve the situation for certain, um, certain lines only. So uh, it's not something that we are seeing uh, significant improvements at speed, but it's something that, that OpenReach is, is, is continuing to, uh, to deploy and we are monitoring as part of the Connected Nations report. Glenn, do you want to come in there? Just a, quick, a quick point, convener, um, on the question that Mr. Stevenson asked about the, the consumers and pricing um, point. We, so we do produce a lot of material um, specifically aimed at consumers to allow them to, to understand what sort of choices are available to them. Um, and I would draw attention in particular to the work we do on uh, quality of service, um, which uh, looks at each of the different providers uh, and looks at how successful they've been in, prov in the prov provision of service to consumers uh, and reports annually on that to allow consumers to make a choice about whether they want to move. What, what we then do rub up against is the point that Jonathan made about the choice that's available to people in rural areas, which was what Mr. Stevenson asked about in particular, where that choice is more limited for the reasons we've been discussing. Okay, I'm going to come back to Mike on, on, and I'm going to ask Mike. Sorry, if you could, if you could stick to the R100 at the moment, because there are other members who want to come in on that. Right. I mean, I, I think the important point I'm trying to ask about is competition. Okay. Well, can I, can I just because we've mentioned R100, J Jamie, did you want to come in briefly on R100, or should we? Uh, well, it, it is a supplementary to the original noted question, which isn't mine, so I'm not sure how you want to. Well, I, I'll. I'll t well, Competition. If it, it is yours on R100, sorry. Yes. Just, right, we'll take R100 and then I'll come back to you, Mike. So, okay. Jamie. Um, good uh, morning, panel. Um, I, I, I really want to bring it back to something that um, Mr. Preston said in his opening statement, and that was around the fact that he found last week's evidence session enlightening um, because <coughs> it gave you uh, some more insight into the Scottish Government's plans. That sounds terribly worrying as a statement to me. What why do you have to watch parliamentary committees to understand what the Scottish Government's doing in terms of its R100 project? Um, I appreciate there are a number of parallel systems running at the moment, one of which you do have a statutory duty to involve yourself in, in that respect, being the UK Government's USO. But given that there already has been a DSSB project and now a Reaching 100 project, additional organic commercial market progress in certain areas and regulatory driven market progress in other areas. 
It doesn't sound to me that there's a huge amount of joined up discussion or thinking <coughs> around these parallel, often confusing to the consumer programmes. Do you have any comments on that? The right answer to your question is it's not necessary to watch the parliamentary uh, engagement for us to, you know, to, for us to understand what's happening. It's just a helpful part of the process. Uh, we can and do talk uh, to the Scottish Government all the time. I mean, that's several times, several times a week uh, if you want to, to, to put a kind of uh, a metric on it. Um, and we have been having a conversation with, uh, with them uh, and at a UK level with the DCMS about the interaction between uh, their R100 programme um, and what the UK government has now decided to do with the, the regulatory USO. Just on a point of detail, we're not, we're not yet responsible for the USO and we don't know what the final terms of that are going to be. Um, we understand the legislation will be laid towards the end of this month uh, and that will set out exactly what's required of Ofcom. Um, and that's when the conversation will start uh, and why it's helpful just to, to look at the, the, the evidence that was given by, uh, by Fergus Ewing and his team last week. Um, about about how these two things sit together, you know, so how, how we deal with the issue of costs and pricing and so on, bearing in mind that it's a complementary or, or, a, or a separate policy objective and programme being run by, uh, run by the Scottish Government. So um, wh when we are given that formal responsibility and understand what the parameters are for the USO, um, we will sit down with the Scottish Government, with the Scottish Futures Trust uh, and other bodies in Scotland, like Highlands and Islands Enterprise, for example, um, to have a conversation with them about how this all fits together uh, and allows us to make our decisions about the regulatory responsibility we'll have for implementing the USO. Thank you. We, I'm going to come back to Mike now. Sorry, Mike, it, okay. it's been a roundabout way, but you, I'd like to push on some yeah, of the points on, you've got. On competition still. Um, <clears throat> the key for a better service for the consumer is information. And it strikes me that there's huge confusion out there between 10 megabits, 24 megabits, 30 megabits, promises of, 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 of level of service. And we all know, I mean, I've been in discussions with which, for instance, the consumer organization, and we all know that um, suppliers, providers, know what service they're getting to individual properties throughout the country. And I know which people would particularly like to ask, and I'm gonna ask them because I'm interested in it too. In your regulatory role over the providers, can you, and perhaps you could explain if you don't, why you can't, um, can you get the providers to provide and publish data that they have on individual premises and consumers so that those individual consumers will actually know um, what information is held on them, reference the service that they can receive at the moment? Are you with me on my question? <laughs> So perhaps perhaps uh, Gary could uh, expand on, on the, the, the definitional points, but um, in terms of your point about consumer information, mm. um, Ofcom publishes a, a wealth of, of data that's available on our website. Um, more generally, for coverage, and I know your, your question was about price, but we have online maps where you can check this. We have comparison uh, Ofcom yeah, credit but, 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 the, the but my point is, the providers, you are not the providers, you are the regulators. The providers have all this information. You are the regulators to the providers. Those providers could provide that information on an individual basis to consumers. You publish a lot of information generally. That's not what I'm asking about. Right. I'm asking about in your role as a regulator for the organizations that are the providers, can you get the providers to provide this information on, an indi on individual premises? Like to do that. Uh, I think we've all had letters saying that from constituents that, that we were promised this by the provider and when we actually asked them, they, they said they couldn't actually deliver it, having promised it. I mean, I think that's my, what, yeah. what you're yeah. drilling down on. <coughs> Who would like to go on that? Gary. Uh, for the purposes of Connected Nations, we get data from all of the major providers on the kinds of uh, services, broadband services, they can deliver to every residential property and small business property in the UK. That's a, a considerable data set. Mm. And that data set previously has been updated on an annual basis, but from this year we will update it more frequently, three times a year. Um, now that information uh, has significant value to us as an organization. We also make it available in various uh, uh, guises to policy makers. But of course, consumers would like to know mm. Uh, what kind of service they can reasonably expect at, at, their, at their premise. That 
as Jonathan's already mentioned, and as I'm sure you're aware, that we do make information available via our checker tool. That will give you, if you put your address in, the information, the most up-to-date information we have on the speeds that the operators predict. And their models are relatively accurate if you, if you uh, take out um, the, if you take, if you factor out the occasional faults that people may get on their broadband lines, generally what, what these models predict is, is what people uh, receive in terms of the, the speed delivered to their premise. Um, you can find out using our online checker tools and apps what uh, the kind of service you can expect at home. Your, your point about whether we can make that information, we can, we can encourage the providers to make that information available. The, the approach we're currently pursuing is a, a voluntary approach. Uh, we, we've approached um, BT, OpenReach, and Virgin Media in the first instance uh, to encourage them to make address level data available to price comparison websites, which is the main way in which consumers would access that information. Uh, and those discussions are ongoing. So it's something you're pursuing? The, the, the voluntary approach is something we're currently pursuing. And if they don't do it voluntarily, would you consider requiring them? We were monitoring progress, and uh, that wasn't a yes. we, we, we clearly we, we clearly have an, an interest in making sure that consumers have as accurate information as they can to inform their mm -hmm. their, their buying decisions. And so, yeah. we, we have a number of ways to do that. So we, we, yeah. we maintain our own websites, and we would encourage operators to. Uh, if, if the convener will allow me, just make one comment. Um, there's, there's a difference between saying consumers can do something, and they can find out something with a check than requiring the providers who have that information to make it available to consumers <coughs> when they're entering contracts. There's quite a difference, and I hope the voluntary approach works. If it doesn't, um, I would hope that we can be back again to see how we can pursue this. Okay, do you, I mean, do you have any other questions? Because, no. Stuart, you want, you've got a question on this. I, I, just what, I'm slightly puzzled by this. Uh, having changed both my broadband contracts in the last two years, in each case, I was given an estimate of the download speed and a contractual commitment to at least meet that speed, which allowed me to cancel. And in one case, I was promised 68 and I'm getting 82. That's down here. And at home, I was promised 6 and I'm getting 8. Um, but the key point is, that, that's really my, really my question, um, is given that the particular provider that I'm signed up with, I'm not going to name names, so you can probably work out who it is, um, is able to make that kind of contractual commitment. Is that something Ofcom would wish to pursue generally across the industry? Because if one supplier can make that kind of contractual equipment, it means there's a no penalty to me option to cancel early if it's not delivered. Why can't everybody do it? Particularly in my exchange, back it's all one infrastructure, even though there's multiple of it. Jonathan. Um, so so the, the short answer to that, and, and refer back to my, my previous answer, would be the, the broadband speeds code of practice. Um, if you aren't getting the speeds that you were promised at the point of sale, you are permitted to execute your contract without, without penalty. So that, that, that is what we would point to when uh, concerns like that are, are raised. Um, there perhaps are te te underlying technical reasons about how they manage traffic, uh, perhaps at, at peak times. But um, again, the, the, the measure that we would point to, and it's, it's outlined in our annual plan or proposed annual plan, is, is the Broadband Speeds Code of Practice. And it's also worth adding as well in terms of consumer protection that we have um, now published a final decision on automatic compensation. So if you for whatever reason, uh, experience a fault on your line or you're without service um, for uh, a particular period of time, you are entitled to, to automatic compensation. And given that part of the network for delivery is the domestic customer's own network in their house, and in my case, the speed more than doubled when we replaced one socket, how are you dealing with that issue, which isn't really my supplier's issue? Because I suspect that's a common cause of difficulty. Um, perhaps Gary could add to this, but um, there are a, a number of things that consumers or con consumers can do in their house to improve their broadband speeds. Um, one of uh, Ofcom's most um, publicised uh, uh, 
reports on this was in relation to uh, the, the factors that can affect Wi-Fi speeds um, and there the are various electrical interference uh, <coughs> problems that, that can result in a speed degradation in your house. So again, it's pr perhaps not the solution to the problem, but there are things, and again, this is all on the Ofcom website, that um, people can look at to improve their broadband speeds now. And I'm going to leave that there and move on to the next question, which is from Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much. It will be fairly brief, a fair bit of it's covered. Um, we're looking at the USO of 10 megabits, but the Scottish Government is, of course, uh, through its R100, seeking to deliver 30 uh, megabits to have a, a, a substantially higher standard, and indeed the upload speed as well of one uh, megabit. It, it, basically, how do the two regimes interoperate, or is that unclear to you as yet, um, in that the UK legally mandated requirement is, is different from the target that the Scottish Government has set? Okay, Jonathan. Um, so for, firstly, we, we're supportive of any government initiative that seeks to improve connectivity, uh, regardless if that's coming from the UK Government or, or indeed the Scottish Government. The, um, broadband USO, which we've uh, spoken about um, uh, again, in, in, or it's, it's came up in a, a number of forums, uh, we, we would have a formal legal duty to implement that. At, at the moment, uh, the draft statutory instrument that was published alongside the consul, DCMS consultation last year, uh, as you said, was for 10 megabits down, one, one up. We expect that to, to, to be the case. Um, we have when this was at the stage of a voluntary deal that was being proposed, we'd engaged extensively with the Scottish Government on these issues. Uh, I think to answer your question, it's, it's, it's a case of timing. We, we will, throughout the course of the next few months, I'm sure, see, see more details on this. But um, we are acutely aware of the overlapping nature of both programmes. And uh, as I said, we've, we've got an excellent working relationship with the Scottish right. Government. Right, if I can move on to another yeah. subject, and I'm not going to open it up too much because I know colleagues will do so, um, specifically related to awards of spectrum. And in your opening uh, remarks, I, I, I think it was Jonathan, uh, referred to in particular the 700 megahertz uh, spectrum, which is of particular interest to Scotland for 5G. Um, given that uh, the north of Scotland in particular would be the ideal testing ground for that frequency because there's a great need uh, because it will be distant from any interference from other jurisdictions who might be using the same frequencies. And indeed, Freeview started in the north of Scotland and ended up in the southeast of England for that reason. What are we doing to make sure that the, the rural implementation of 5G, which is very different from what's planned for the cities, technologically and otherwise, is actually at the front of what we might do in looking at the awards of spectrum. We'll explore the whole issue of connectivity uh, later in our question. Uh, uh, Glenn, uh, well, Matthew, come in on that one. Shall I start and then, uh, and then maybe Glenn will pick up on specifics, but in terms of um, spectrum overall and awards, uh, I mean, it's probably worth noting that we're, we're at a point now where over <coughs> the next few years, there is a series of clearances and awards coming up, not, geez, not least uh, just on the, um, bands that you've mentioned, but others. Uh, so, for instance, in, you know, in relation to 5G, I think we are some way away, but obviously we're looking at the 26 gigahertz band as well and what else might be done there. But to come to your, your point... But, but just to be fair, 26 gigahertz is very short range, Correct. is about covering cities. It's Indeed. absolutely no value uh, that's worth talking about to yep. rural areas, and we are the rural committee. So I'm particularly focusing on the 700 megahertz. Correct which is what will deliver 5G for local yeah. areas. Now, I maybe be, I sound as if I know what I'm talking about. We should not make the assumption I have a complete knowledge. I don't. No, I think, I think that is, I think that's a very accurate summary of the differences between the two bands. And clearly, you know, 700 is more imminent because we are, you know, embarking on the clearance process for that. I know that there is a kind of 
there is a quite now quite a detailed program in place for how that be cleared area by area. Uh, I don't have the specifics with me, but we'd be we'd be happy to provide that. That is something that was in within the annual plan this year. Um, and then we're obviously looking at, you know, once the spectrum is cleared and the award process, what within the award process can you do to encourage further competition and certainly obligations in terms of the geographic coverage? So it's, it's I guess the, my abiding point is it's the first step in a particular spectrum band. And we're also trying to look at the wider um, use of spectrum and what is more appropriate to different kind of areas. I, Glenn, I, Glenn, I'm sure Mike I should declare specific. an interest in that I'm currently on zero G. <laughs> uh, yep, Glenn, sorry, I'll just come uh, confused. As it, as it was me that mentioned 700, not Jonathan, yeah. it's only fair, I, I, think it's only fair I, I respond to it, I think. So, um, as Matt said, we are, um, I mean, we're and we due to consult on uh, the 700 uh, spectrum process uh, in the next handful of weeks. Uh, and it will actually cover, you know, we expect it to cover the areas that you've asked about, you know, as kind of applicability to rural areas, uh, you know, how, how we might go about, uh, how we might go about doing that. There are different options um, yeah, that yeah. we could look at, as you'll be aware. So um, we'll, you know, we'll come to members of the Scottish Parliament and ask them to contribute to that uh, ahead of when we get round to awarding the final spectrum next year. The the other thing that's just worth saying, you mentioned 5G um, and the other thing, the other, the other conversation we're having at a UK level, uh, but also with uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust is um, how we how we help deliver on the kind of five street five G strategy and supporting test beds and trials programs because um, we do offer licences for that um, and we would expect you know Scotland like other other bits of the UK or bits of Scotland will be interested in in participating in that we will explore those options. Glenn, can I just push a little bit on that? I mean, Stuart's made a point of, uh, about having uh, large parts of Scotland having no G on their their, their phones at all and look. Some people in Scotland feel that looking towards 5G, when, when a lot of places have no G, especially in the north, which I class as north of Inverness, but Stuart may have a different definition, <laughs> um, it, it's really hard to stomach for those rural areas. So will Ofcom be pushing um, current providers to make sure that, that 4G is rolled out across the areas that don't have it now without allowing companies to get distracted by future technology? before they've delivered what they should have done already? So I think the short answer to the question is yes. Um, we are currently um, assessing uh, the, the existing obligations and the extent to which they've been met, and we'll publish uh, a final report on that over the course of the next couple of months. So that's those that due, were, were due to come to the end, at the end, end of December uh, 2017. Um, it, is, it is worth saying also that the Connected Nations data, which Gary referred to, actually uh, goes back to the summer of last year. So we would have thought the, the pictures actually improved quite dramatically. Uh, and we will uh, we will be publishing more frequently, as Gary mentioned already this year, data that should should allow people to, to have or more up to date information. But the, the new awards that are coming up uh, to, to answer your question are you know we're, we're not just looking towards 5G, we're also looking to to make sure that people can have sensible voice and data uh, services, um, and that's why 700, particularly in rural Scotland, is is attractive to us because we, we that should allow for people to be able to make voice calls and and use data uh, in a better way than they can at the moment and respond to your point that there are still geographic areas in Scotland where it's not possible to get a signal. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, I think you've got the next question. Hey, good morning, panel. Um, I'd, I'd like to pick up on the, the obligation you have about uh, protecting people from harm, whether that's unfair practices or indeed specific harm and ensuring cyber resilience. Now, if Mr Stevenson has, says he has little knowledge, I have zero knowledge in comparison. So I'm going to ask you about T-based uh, uh, which I'm told is a new intelligence-led cybersecurity penetration test framework for communication providers. Um, you know, it's a security measure um, which I understand identifies and would respond to specific cyber attacks. Now, in the Highlands and Islands, and, and indeed in other rural areas, many local communities have established their own networks. How can you ensure that these networks maintain good security and resilience um, practice, please? Who'd like to? You're all looking the other way. So, John, it must have been a good question. I know. I uh, Glenn, I think you're going to have to go on that. I, I will, and I'm, I'm not sure I have that much to say, to be honest. So, um, 
So we, so we do have, uh, Ofcom does have some regulatory responsibilities specifically in respect of um, sort of physical, physical resilience of national networks. Um, and we do work with the providers and with governments um, to make sure that the you know, adequate protections are in place. I'm afraid I don't know the answer, um, unless somebody else does, to, to those kind of more local and community networks. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid I don't have an answer to, uh, to the, the a precise answer to the question, but just to acknowledge uh, T-BEST is something which uh, yeah. members of my team are uh, engaged with over the, uh, currently and over the, the next 12 months. We are uh, in the process of, uh, of, of Ofcom's duties around uh, security, resilience and cyber are in the process of changing. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, which means we, I, I'm not currently in position to offer a response to that, but it does sound like something which I'd be very happy to, to follow up with, with the committee. That, that, would, that, that would be good if, if you could perhaps come back to that. Can you say then in the interim what measures are in place and um, specifically when you do come back to us if there is a, a rollout programme? Okay. Maybe just a little bit more on the existing um, protections that... I'm afraid I don't have any detailed understanding. Uh, that, that I, I, I suspect the little knowledge I have wouldn't answer your question. So I can come back with a, with a, a comprehensive view of, of what we currently do and how that's likely to change as we inherit these, these new uh, and changed duties. Okay, that'd be very helpful, thank you. John, you, you, it indicated earlier you might want to drill down a wee bit into local communities with their own networks and, and security there. Do you, do you think you've had the answer? Uh, well, I, I thought Gary said he'd perhaps come back in more detail with that aspect. Too. Okay. Okay, um, um, uh, Richard wants to come in, and Stuart, I'll take Stuart first, and then Richard. It's a very specific point uh, related to the increased number of quite small telecom providers, um, and in relation to the uh, fixed line provision. Um, these providers have an enduring responsibility to provide the switching capability for numbers they issue, even if the customer becomes a customer of another company. Um, there has been one instance in Aberdeen, it was about five or six years ago, when, they, when a telecoms provider failed, and therefore the switching capability was removed, and therefore people lost access to the telephone numbers, even though they were not with the failing company. Are there plans on Ofcom's part to provide a step-in facility that would protect and cover the switching capability that is an enduring responsibility of all fixed line telecom providers because it was immensely disruptive when that happened and it strikes me it's something that we could do something about. Jonathan. Um, so yeah, I entirely agree when, when loss of service issues arise, particularly in rural communities, it's felt um, acutely. Um, it's worth saying that Ofcom doesn't have a formal role in administering or, or managing these community broadband schemes. Um, we're aware that obviously some of the problems and challenges they face relate to access to backhaul, which they need to connect to, to the main network. Um, a lot of these providers, and uh, I'm not sure in the specific case you mentioned, Mr Stevenson, rely on fixed wireless um, access. Um, and there has been a number of cases uh, in, over the course of the past year where uh, failing um, wholesale providers, uh, I think in one of the cases that comes to mind was AB Internet, yeah. and that had a, a downstream effect on uh, a project in Loch Tay, um, where again it was a couple of hundred people lost uh, service, and obviously that is, has a huge impact on businesses and, and local communities. To, to answer your specific point about Ofcom's role there, um, it's more tricky when it's a fixed wireless provider. When it is on the open reach network, um, there is a process in place called the supplier of, of last resort. Can, it, can I just be clear? I'm making a very narrow point about losing the right to a particular telephone number. Oh, OK, yeah. Because this, it, this is hypothetical. You, you, you could have a telephone provider in Edinburgh who provides numbers in the range 0131 998 and then the digits beyond that. They have to provide the computer that is the first place where that number goes to be switched to whatever provider it is. They fail, people lose access to the 998, whatever. 
that's the specific thing that affected yeah. thousands of customers in the city of Aberdeen. It wasn't actually a rural issue at all. Um, and it, it was some time ago, so. So the, the, there's, there's two points there. Uh, Ofcom has, uh, I think it's general condition 18, which relates to number portability. So everyone has the right to request that their, their number can be ported. And an example where there's a, a loss of service issue, um, as far as I'm aware, these numbers are held in a bank for up to six months. Uh, I'm not aware of the specifics of that case, I'm sorry, but that, that's the general principles. That I, I, I don't want to over-egg the pudding too much because you may have to go away and think about it. It's, not, it, it's simply that the failed provider has the technical duty mm -hmm. of just the way the network works. When you dial that number, it goes to their computer, even if the contract the person has was with an entirely other company. And it's that issue they're protecting the access that people have to a specific number, which will be on all the note papers, it will be in the telephone directories, and so on and so forth. So you know, it really, it really sounds a tiny thing, but for the companies who lost their number, I mean, it wasn't a question of the service was down for a week some, while somebody else stepped in. They permanently lost the right to their number, and it's that issue. But, but let's not over the pudding, convener. I, I, I Maybe think, we can come I think back. we've... Dwelled on that. Maybe Jonathan, you could uh, write to the committee and, yes, and, and let us know because I, th I think it is a serious point. But but quite how widespread it is, you could perhaps let us know in the correspondence. I, I know that Richard Lau wants to come in. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if anyone's picking it up. But you were on. You know, Ofcom's going on about service and cost and uh, good provision, etc. I remember the good old days when you phoned directory inquiries and it cost you about five pence. Remember what five pence was? Now you dial directory inquiries to any provider and it can cost you from one pound to two pound to three pound. If you stupidly say, yeah, put me through to the, the number, thank you, and you forget you're, you're being directed and then directed again. What are you going to do about that? What are you doing to reduce the cost of directory inquiries? Um, I knew I shouldn't have let you in, Richard, because that was the question I wanted to ask. But I think it's a genuine point that we've all been approached, especially with those uh, constituents that don't have access to broadband, to look up directory inquiries. They have to go through directory inquiries. And then, because they haven't got a pen to write it down, they do end up going through, and it costs them a huge amount of money. So it's in your report. What are you going to do about it? Uh, Matthew, you're going to answer on that. Well, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, y yes, it is in our report, and it's, um, you know, it's one of the priorities for this coming year. Um, I mean, without recapping too far, it, it's obviously a market that was deregulated, and when you deregulate uh, markets, you, you run the risk of introducing sharp practice, Etc. In some cases, yes. On the other hand, you know, you, you hope that you get some of the benefits of competition between provision, but we entirely accept that where the competition doesn't work, you do need to step in to protect consumers. And I think we are very aware that this, you know, we are talking about, in some cases, particularly vulnerable groups of consumers who are more dependent on their landline. So there, there is a, in, in the UK, there still remains about a, a million or so households who are landline only okay. users. They don't take advantage of. Um, internet technologies, etc., and that would be their way of, of finding these numbers. Great words, Matthew, but can you, can you set a cost? Can you say to all these providers, sorry, you're not charging £1.50, you can charge 50 pence, or you can charge whatever, but you're not charging what you're charging now. Can you, can you regulate that? Can you say, can you enforce that? Yes or no? Ma Ma Matthew, I'm happy if you want to give a sharp answer to that, cool. because you've made the comment that you believe, I think your words were sharp practice, and it is in your report that you want to do something about it, um, and, and that regulation may be required. So Indeed. just confirmation that, that, that you can do something about it may, may be answer Richard's question. We would, we would look at a number of... I'm sorry I can't give you the yes-no, but it, it's, it's an option on the table. We're at the stage, though, of looking at... The transparency in the pricing first and how those markets are operating. I, I do hope we don't have to ask you the same question in a year's time. Uh, Colin. 
Beener, um, Ofcom's consumer protection regulation is obviously underpinned by the, the general conditions of entitlement. You've made a number of changes to these recently. The most high-profile ones are obviously around issues like nuisance calling and uh, protecting vulnerable um, residents. Can you tell me, uh, with regards to the new set of conditions, will they have any specific impact on consumer, sorry, communication providers within Scotland? Uh, Jonathan, I think you're getting directed to answer by Glenn. <laughs> um, so, uh, if, if I understood the question correctly, will, will these changes apply to communications providers in Scotland? Um, yes, of course, it's, it's UK-wide uh, rules. Um, in terms of nuisance calls specifically, um, obviously the Scottish Government has its own action plan and we, we've been involved um, it's quite extensively with that and a number of other organisations. Um, as far as we are, nuisance calls are, are coming down, but the research, I think, from which had shown that there was uh, there was a higher prevalence of nuisance calls in Scotland, and uh, any of the measures we've, we've put in place in the general conditions, of course, we would hope to see that uh, have a greater impact in, in, in Scotland, if, if, if that... Yeah, I, I mean, I just, in particular, is, will the, the rules obviously cover UK wide? Is there any disproportionate impact on on the, the, the communication providers within Scotland that these new rules are likely to, to have? N not as far as I'm aware. Um, just before we leave this subject, I mean, I think that again, we all receive letters from constituents who are complaining about receiving call, calls to do with. I think the latest one is the new government boiler scrappage scheme um, and this scheme and that scheme. And we block or we advise them to block their calls uh, to these and take them, do a call preference, works for a couple of months and then off it goes again. I mean, there is a genuine, I believe, dissatisfaction with the way that's regulated. Is that something that you will be dealing with and looking at more closely? Because it's just not working what we have at the moment, I, I would say, from my mailbag. I think uh, the short answer to the question is yes. Um, so it's it's not only for Ofcom to be able to um, to respond to the nuisance calls issues. The advice that we were offering to the nuisance calls commission in Scotland and we've been offering at a UK level is is technical. So it's it's working with the communications providers to look at what the technical solutions are to be able to block these things at source. Um, but it's a you know it's a challenging game because they continue to change the technology um, and, and and it's really a matter of trying to to, trying to keep up with that. Um, we are having a uh, we, are, we are continuing to be part of the, the kind of nuisance calls commission implementation in Scotland alongside the likes of the information commissioner's office, uh, who have some greater powers uh, in relation to the protection of personal data and data privacy. Um, so I think that's a space that we think is quite rich for um, being able to push you know to push those companies that are. are, are doing the sorts of practices that, you, that you've identified. Uh, I mean, it was, the Nuisance Calls Commission was interesting because it demonstrated um, something which you, you've just touched on, Convena, which is quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of the practices seem to relate to sort of public, public schemes um, and were, related, you know, were relating to, to uh, policy objectives of the, of the Scottish Government, I think, which would, had gone kind of unnoticed until, uh, until the Commission really started to look at the, the background to this stuff. So we are, we are working with them just to identify where those schemes may be uh, and how we can provide technical advice um, to stop people from the, the sorts of sharp practices that we mentioned. Just, just before we leave that, I mean, one of the easiest ways to do it would make sure that anyone who made these calls had to identify themselves and give their number but they're all on number with held, so you can't ring them back yeah. and check them out. And I would have thought that any uh, UK company should be enforced to, to, to not mask their number so people could actually then stop it. Uh, do you have a view on that? Well, I, th I think these are some of the solutions that we're looking at. I think there's a... I don't know. Uh, I don't know the exact detail, but I think there's a significant problem uh, with this happening at an, in, at an international level. Um, so it's not. It's not simply a case of uh, being able to identify uh, the UK companies. Although clearly, if we could, if, you know, if we had the scope to do that, we would consider it. Um, the practice does seem to be one where a, a, the proliferation of calls, in many ways, has, has come from other parts of uh, of the world. Looks like Gary might want to might want to, to come in on this particular point and requires an international solutions in the forums that we are we are members of. Okay, Gary. Just to add to that, there's an additional problem of uh, of spoofing. Some companies may uh, may hide their actual number by putting in a false number so that the consumer 
uh, may be um, forced to answer the call, may answer the call expecting it to be from someone else. And that makes the problem of enforcing uh, significantly harder. There are some technical solutions, and as, as, as Glenn says, there's, there's a number of, of technical um, aspects to this that we're currently looking into and uh, providing advice. I, I think it would be greatly appreciated by people who receive these calls at all times of the night, sometimes, uh, if we could get on top of it. I would probably leave that there and move on to the next question, which is John's. Uh, thanks, Gavino. Interesting, there was just a mention there of uh, kind of international cooperation. There's a, there's a section in your work plan for 1819 headed Engage During Changes to European Legislation. Uh, and, I mean, there's a fair bit of detail in there, but I'm just wondering how you see that going forward, especially is Brexit going to have an effect? Are people going to notice any changes, or will we end up effectively being part of a whole European-wide uh, following all the same regulations? I think you might, you're probably picking up on some of the changes to legislation which are kind of already in train and, and, and indeed were at a European level um, before there was any and kind of vote on Brexit. So we have been engaged, um, as with many member states, uh, for a number of years around the AVMS directive uh, and revisions to that, and also the electronics communications framework, which obviously governs uh, fixed line telco. Uh, those, we expect um, the proposals to be adopted on the former during the, uh, the current, current annual period uh, on the ECF. Uh, a slightly later time scale, but they are kind of changes that are, that are coming through to those legislation. Um, I'm not sure about dramatic changes. I think the kind of some of the core principles um, remain uh, on the AVMS front. There are changes to the kind of some of the requirements around on-demand services and kind of adapting to a, a new world of delivery of audiovisual services. Um, so, so is the picture that we've committed to some of these things because we're currently in the EU? And therefore, these commitments would still hold yes. going forward, but well, unless somebody positively changed them. Indeed, indeed. So, so there wouldn't be a kind of gap. Yeah. No, we've been, we've been signatories to these arrangements and indeed, indeed their predecessors, um, and they are incorporated within UK law currently. So unless there was a, an, an effective decision to um, change what we had adopted, they remain. Okay. And I mean, one thing that consumers will be worried about is roaming charges, because it took a long time to get rid of them. I mean, will Scottish, British people be charged, or do we not know when they go to Europe, what about people coming here, will, will any of that be affected? It, it, it's actually outside of those particular bits of legislation. There's obviously the kind of the, the separate uh, provisions that were made, and I think they came into effect last year, so in, in June. Um, I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's everyone's aspiration and hope that you have as much continuity as possible, and it's an, you know, it's an intervention that has been broadly welcomed by consumers. We hope it remains. It, it's obviously, you know, it's subject to agreements continuing and it might form part of the negotiations as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next question is from Peter. Yes, good morning, uh, gentlemen. My question is about the, uh, the, the, the bidding process for the R100 scheme. We're told that, uh, you know, Superfast broadband is at 94% in urban areas and only 56% in rural areas. So the, we're told that the bidding process for R100 will concentrate on rural areas initially. And the, the, the country's being divided up into three a, a geographical areas for that bidding process to happen. And we obviously want to get competitive bids and value for money. And hopefully contracts awarded by early 2019. Is Ofcom involved in that process? Or, or, you know, what role do you have within that process to ensure that we do get competitive bids that, that are going to deliver on the, on the expectations to deliver 100 per cent to uh, you know, a super fast broadband to, to the whole of the, the Scottish uh, rural areas? Jonathan. So, so the short answer to that is uh, no, we're not, we don't have a formal role in our 100 programme uh, to date. Uh, as sort of alluded to earlier, it has been about providing technical advice and expertise. Um, on your point about uh, building competition into the bidding process, um, yep, you're quite right. The Scottish Government have divided it into three geographic lots. From what I can gather, um, they, have, they are prioritising the north lot first. 
Um, so it's well, well documented that sort of other European countries have followed what's referred to as a, a, an outside in approach. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if that's directly applicable, but the, the principle is the same. It's to prioritise the hardest to reach areas first. Um, from what we can gather from uh, discussions with the Scottish Government and to the documents they've published, um, they've taken or th their aim is to build as much competition into that process as possible. Um, that may involve, uh, given that there'll be potentially a, a range of technologies used that could involve smaller uh, providers and indeed I, I've, I've attended uh, workshops where smaller providers have, have expressed an interest in R100 um, but again the, the, the general principle or the aim is, is to build in a competitive bidding process which mm. Ofcom obviously uh, in principle agrees with as, as we've sort of said earlier competition is one of the best means of incentivising uh, investment. But just to follow up on that, you, you have no real knowledge at the moment as to how that process is going forward. You, you know, you're, you're not involved, you say you're not directly involved, but do, do you have a feel for how it is, how it is progressing or not? Well, I mean, of, of Comax independently from, from both the UK and, and the Scottish Government, so I don't know if it would be appropriate for us, for us to comment on, on the, the future merits of it. I mean, our Connected Nations report and the data that you referred to is, is retrospective. Mm. Um, so our role there is to comment on progress rather than sort of looking to the future and, and speculating as mm. to what, um, what might happen. But um, while we have no formal role, uh, we have engaged extensively with the Scottish Government on this and as we've said we will have to take account of this now that we'll mm. have a formal duty on, on the, the UK Government's universal service obligation. Glenn do you want to come in on that? Jonathan's made the, made the point so that, that I was going to but it is worth stressing it that um, in relation to the procurement specifically there is no there is no role for Ofcom but we will continue to you know to, to talk to the Scottish Government because uh, the same question that Mr Green asked earlier that interaction that Jonathan said uh, between reaching 100 and the universal service obligation, you know, which we will have that formal implementing role to do, mm. uh, is critical. You know, we need we need to make sure we get that absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question then is from Fulton. Thank you. Good morning, panel. At last uh, week's committee evidence session, there was a bit of discussion around uh, individual consumers upgrading to superfast packages. Has Ofcom done? any research to explain why consumers aren't taking this option? Glenn, do you want to go or are you going to... Uh, Jonathan, start. Okay. Um, so, uh, th th thanks for the question. So, f firstly, in, in the Connected Nations report, uh, I think the figure's 39% take up of super fast broadband. <laughs> I, I don't think there's a, a clear reason yet as to why people aren't taking this up. It could be the case that they feel that it's, it's not necessary. Um, I mean, Ofcom's research published, uh, is published research, sorry, which says that 10 megabits per second is probably uh, about enough at the moment for the typical household. Um, the Scottish Government obviously has, has made um, the case for or set out a range of measures to try and encourage take up in its digital strategy but um, I, I don't think that there's a, a clear answer yet as to why only 39% of people in Scotland are, are taking up super fast but that is broadly in line with what we've seen across the rest of the UK I, I don't think that's a, a an issue that's specific to, to Scotland um, but perhaps obviously is a uh, video streaming services and the demands on data increase people might start to understand the benefits more of, of super fast. Um, but to, to answer your question, it's, it's not yet clear. Um, we have done research on, on consumers' needs and uh, we publish a communication to market report um, each summer which outlines how people are using communication services. So perhaps over time we'll be able to uh, report back to the committee on, on the different ways that people are, are using these services. Gary, do you want to come in on that? I think we may have, uh, I'm, I'm vaguely aware of some research we did um, a while back which tried to, to look at consumers' preferences for, for different broadband products. Uh, I think, as Jonathan points out, that, that it's, it, it's, there's no one particular issue that we've identified. It could be that people don't see the benefits of Superfast. They're quite happy with the, the, the standard broadband services they have. We, we, I think there was about 15% of people who said they thought it was too expensive, which I guess is... Uh, related to the first point, if they don't see 
the merits of superfast. They're not going to uh, consider buying it if they think the cost is too expensive. I mean, th th there is something there about the, 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 the providers of those services, perhaps doing a little bit more to, to articulate the benefits of superfast. And again, as Jonathan has said, more and more people are, are watching content, TV, uh, high definition content. Uh, delivered over the internet, which is going to need a faster speed, and over time we will see that moving towards uh, higher definition, uh, ultra high definition. Which, in which case, you you're really are going to need uh, at least a super fast speed. So, I think it, it's a, it will be a good opportunity uh, for uh, the providers of these services to look at the the costs they are charging, but also, which is of course their decision, uh, but also look at how they can better articulate the benefits of super fast speeds. It, it, You've given a few possible explanations here, um, Jonathan and, and Gary, about why that may be. But is there any um, plans to conduct any research that might give more definitive answers, or do you believe, as, if you've hinted it there, Gary, that this is more of the um, more for the providers to do? We we have a rolling program of, of market research, so I expect that we will continue to ask ask that question, whether it's this year or whether it's, uh, it, it's um, perhaps next year, uh, I, I don't know. But it, it does seem to me that that is a question that having asked it once or twice before, we will continue asking. OK, and just a follow-up question. Uh, well. can I, sorry, just oh, before you do the follow-up, yeah. could I just bring Glenn in and then, and then go back to you, so Fulton, and then one, to Jamie? One quick additional point. So we, we have talked about take-up also with um, the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy, and um, you know, he, he was con he's been conscious both with DSSB uh, but having to think about the design of reaching 100, that government will need to play quite an active role in the promotion of the fact that the services are available for people to take up in the first place. So I think it will it'll be a combination of uh, the market research that we provide to inform policymakers, the providers themselves doing the promotion, as Gary said, uh, and government particularly where there's um, public interventions, whether it's the universal service obligation or reaching 100, uh, having to play their part in that promotion as well. Fulton. Yeah, um, it's, it's on advertising, uh, convener. Are, are, are you happy that uh, the guidance provided by Advertising Standards Authority on broadband speed claims and adverts will have the necessary impact on consumer protection? Um, Glenn. I mean, I, d I don't think we would sort of formally assess what another regulator is doing in that in that type of way, but but clearly, as Jonathan said earlier, the Advertising Ad Standards Agency have felt that the point that a number of members have made about the the advertising of up to speeds um, hasn't been hasn't been adequate, you know, and they've intervened in the market and told the have told the providers that they're going to have to change. So we'll we'll absolutely continue to talk to them about it. Uh, it has direct relevance to the provisions in our revised broadband um, speeds code that Jonathan mentioned earlier as well so that's the bit that we'll continue to keep an eye on to make sure that it's up to up to date to reflect those advertising practices Jamie thank you convener um, following on from Fulton's questioning uh, the conversation often is around uh, technical delivery of broadband and improving that um, we don't often talk about digital participation in its wider sense and some of the barriers to access for consumers um, I wonder if Ofcom has done any uh, research as part of its consumer research into um, uh, some of the potential cost barriers. I know, for example, one of those may be the fact that in many of these broadband packages, you also have to take out a fixed uh, landline as part of the package, which is obviously a, an, an additional cost, in some cases doubling the cost. And anecdotally, may, perhaps many lower-income households uh, do not need or require a, a landline uh, so maybe we'll be paying for it, but not even install a telephone per se, but just have a Wi-Fi router. So I wonder what behaviour analysis has been done around that so that we can perhaps increase digital participation, especially in lower income households. Shall, shall I begin? I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a fair observation. Uh, it is one of a potential number of barriers for people taking up services. I, th I think it's probably undeniable that as uh, the markets for different telco products has become more complicated, more providers, more variations within that, uh, there is there's going to be a wider set of barriers. Um, we have done research in the past around uptake. I think we are going to, within this annual period, have a particular push. Uh, it's under a, a project that we're calling consumer engagement more, more widely, but looking at exactly those types of issues. Uh, it, it kind of, the genesis of that is we have um, you know, acted uh, and, and intervened um, 
quite strongly in favour of switching and in terms of auto compensation in the last few years, and yet the kind of the, the levels of people you know, making changes to their providers as a result or changing their packages it perhaps isn't what you might expect from there. So that, that is a kind of the kind of the genesis of that project is looking at exactly those kind of barriers um, and why people might not be exercising choice in the way we think they might. Jonathan. Um, yeah, just, just, just following up on, on Matthew's point, it's, it's, it's just, we're acutely aware of, of the, the digital divide and how that can be uh, not just a, a rural urban issue, but also because, uh, an issue around wealth and, and social uh, equality. Some operators currently offer standalone broadband packages. Um, you may see the market changed in responding to consumer needs, but the, the example that sort of comes to mind around this very point, and it's something that we've included in our, our communications market report before, is that a number of households in Glasgow um, just simply couldn't afford to have a fixed connection and they were using mobile phone services for, for all sort of internet needs. That brings with it a lot of problems in terms of ability to access uh, benefits, engage with government services. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to complete a, a job application form on a mobile phone. It's uh, extremely difficult. Um, so the, these are things that we are aware of and, and we report on them, and, and if, if I could all just, just give a plug for the cross-party group on digital participation, which uh, I act as a secretary for. Um, we explore a lot of these issues, and there's a number of um, very important organisations in Scotland that are looking at these issues alongside Ofcom, but it's, 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 it's a very good point. Do, just, just to sort of very briefly follow up, do you see a place perhaps in the future, though, where telcos uh, should not uh, require customers to take fixed line uh, contracts if they only want broadband, because at the moment uh, the majority of, of such do require the customer to do that. And does Ofcom have an intervention role perhaps in the future to, to, to push that direction? So, so there's no regulation requiring um, providers to, to offer or tie the packages together. Uh, as I said, it's, it's within sort of their, their own commercial or business models to offer standalone uh, broadband services. Um, just on this sort of standalone services point, it's, it's worth being aware that um, we're aware that people who have standalone landline telephone services, so the, the, the reverse problem, um, that, that's a problem, and particularly older people have had, who perhaps maybe don't want a broadband service, have had to pay for one to get a telephone line. So we, we've introduced measures, um, I think it was last year, which would bring down bills by around five, uh, at least five pounds um, for, for those individuals. So that point about bundled packages, um, in the cost implications, we are, we are acutely aware of that, um, but there isn't any regulations that require providers to, to, to bundle in, in that way. You could require them to unbundle, though? Um, potentially. I, I, I'm not sure what, um, how proportionate a decision that would be. Any Ofcom sort of interventions have to be proportionate, there has to be a sort of cost-benefit analysis undertaken. So I guess we would have to be convinced that the scale of the problem was significant enough that it required um, an intervention on that scale. But yeah. um, I, I've just got a quick question on the rollout of, uh, of R100. I mean, one of the things that the, the, the Scottish Government is relying on is funding from gain share from, from uh, people who, who get the contract. Uh, and my question to you is, considering what you've just said about people taking up super fast broadband, um, do you think the, uh, is there a fear that that gain share may be overplayed or is there a fear that that gain share, you know, some providers might say, well, to continue our service, you've got to, you've, you've got to have super fast broadband. Or do you think that's an unrealistic concern? Um. Well, gain share obviously would see um, money returned back into that the overall R100 mm -hmm. pot for more people taking it up. It is in the commercial, uh, sorry, it's within the, the communications provider's interests to have more customers. So as far as I could see, it would be a win-win situation for, for everyone. I, I'm not sure of the specifics of how much of the gain share money is attributed to the 600 million that's set aside for R100, whether that's additional money or that's that's topping up. I, I, I'm not aware of 
I'm not sure of the, the specifics of, of how that's broken down, but uh, as far as I could see, it being everybody's interest for, for take up to, to increase. Uh, Jonathan, thank you. You confirmed my, my concern that when I asked the question on gain share last week, I, I wasn't sure how much of the £600 million pounds that we've made up. As you've watched it, you obviously share my concern or, uh, or lack of clarity. Move on straight to the next question, which is Richard Lyle. Yes, sir. Good morning again. I'm just reminded that broadband is a reserved matter for the UK government. Can you tell me what is a reserved matter in regards to what, what government is responsible for the provision of mobile phone provision services, um, masks, etc.? What government is that? Jonathan. Um, so, if, firstly, again, all, all telecommunications are reserved to, to Westminster. Um, Spectrum. In terms of mobile, uh, Spectrum is licensed on a, a UK-wide basis. Um, there are government initiatives, um, well, particularly Scottish government initiatives, uh, such as their Mobile Action Plan, which uh, would hope would bring about some real improvements in areas where there's not spots. Uh, so the Scottish government has said that it would look to introduce changes which don't rely on reserved powers, so Spectrum. Um, some of those changes. Uh, just to summarise, involve changing to planning laws. They'd be looking at introducing business rates relief uh, to encourage operators to, to actually put the infrastructure on the ground where it's needed. <coughs> and I think they are also looking at rental guidance um, for how we can make use of public assets or existing public assets. Um, so while Spectrum, and that is um, a key part of mobile connectivity, there are other areas which are devolved, such as planning and business rates, where, where uh, changes could be made that would, would see increased connectivity in, in rural areas. Right, so it is the UK government's responsibility, but uh, the Scottish government is bringing in various initiatives in order to progress. My specific question now is aimed at, and I think, Jonathan, you were, am I right in saying you were the author of... Connect Nations 2017. Yeah. What progress has been made to address mobile not spots and what can Ofcom do to help increase coverage of 4G in Scotland? Now, Ofcom suggests that it's only 17%. I got an email last week from another provider, who I won't name, who says it's more than that. So what is it? So the 17% the, the point uh, relates to, to 4G coverage. Now, an important caveat there, which might not have, have, have came across in some of the coverage over the past week, that that's 17% from all four operators. So that, that, that's an important point, I think, just, just to get on record. That was in the email. Yes. <laughs> so um, in terms of not spots, um, off the top of my head, I think uh, that's 31% of Scotland doesn't have any service from, yeah. from any operator. Now, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Futures Trust have a, well, I think it was last year they published a mobile, <coughs> uh, a, as part of their mobile action plan, sorry, a 4G infill programme. So they have consulted on uh, around 35 sites in these not spot areas where they'd be looking to um, draw on the measures that I mentioned earlier around rates relief um, and infrastructure investment to, to drive coverage to those areas. Right. So that, that percentage should improve dramatically over the next, through Scottish Government initiatives? It's, it's certainly, a, any initiatives that are going to put more base stations in, in rural areas would result in increased coverage regardless right. that, of, of who's I doing I think I've, I've, I've pressed you enough on that and <laughs> some people are getting bored with my uh, saying it's the UK Government's fault, not the Scottish Government's fault. Um, so, um, can you tell me also how does Ofcom support the mobile needs of vulnerable customers? You, you made the, the, the quite uh, uh, pain point about in regards to people trying to do a job application or go on to the, um, benefits from a mobile phone, you know, which is quite hard. So, what, what are you doing to, to help people like that? So, do, do you mean in, in, in to what can you do? the mobile can, phone experience? Or? Yeah, well, vulnerable customer, uh, consumers, you know, people who um, don't have access to the points you were making earlier, landlines or whatever, you know. So, what, what can you, is there anything you can do or is it just a case we'll just need to 
Suck it and see and wait, wait for catch-up. So obviously, um, one, one of the main mechanisms for um, ensuring that vulnerable consumers have, have a good connectivity experience is, is through a universal service obligation. Obviously, there's, there's not one uh, currently for, for mobile services. Um, actually, the, the current existing European framework doesn't allow for a mobile phone universal service obligation. Um, there are obviously challenges, I guess, around the cost of mobile phone services, but um, perhaps somebody could correct me if I'm wrong here. I think these have, have come down greatly over recent years, and by international comparisons, uh, the UK is actually um, not too expensive for mobile phones, but I, I do take the point that um, obviously, as data packages increase as well, the, the cost of, of, of these services go up. I'm going to briefly bring in Glenn and then move to Stuart, if I may. So, I, I, I mean, we have already covered this, but it, I think it's also an answer to your question about what, you know, what can Ofcom do. Um, the, the Spectrum Awards that we've already referenced, not just 700 uh, and its properties being good for remote and rural areas, but some of the other, uh, the other Spectrum bands that Matthew mentioned uh, in his interventions, that's the space you know, where we are you're trying to improve coverage. Um, and trying to uh, allow people to access voice and data services in different parts of Scotland so they can do, you know, so, so they can um, participate uh, both at a social level but also an economic level. Um, and you know, we, we, we do think we, you know, that it's important to recognise that the trajectory of this has, has been upwards. You know, they, there has been quite significant improvements uh, over the course of the last few years. Uh, the data that we publish in Connected Nations, as I say, is, is fast approaching a year, uh, a year out of date. So we will, we will be doing doing the same exercise again two or three times this year that should demonstrate uh, further improvement still. Um, but it's, it, it, it's that, those, those bits of, of Scotland which are just harder to, harder to reach and harder to deliver the infrastructure in that we're really focusing on. Thank you. Stuart. Um, just a quickie, and it's primarily an in interest of another parliamentary committee, but there's a rural aspect to my question. Um, are Ofcom pursuing the issue of uh, terrestrial TV and terrestrial digital audio broadcasting uh, halls, of which there are a substantial number <coughs> in Scotland. Again, I speak personally, among other things. Um, Glenn, do you want to, to lead on that? Um, so I think jo Jonathan might pitch in, but the short, I think the short answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, we are, uh, we're doing quite a lot of work to um, explore the continuing provision. Gary also mentioned the fact, I think, Mr. Stevenson, you might have asked me this question previously, um, around uh, the fact that services are going to be increasingly offered uh, over over the internet only, uh, which gives us some of those quite, you know, takes us to the question about how uh, how the provision of infrastructure is working in those different bits of the uh, rural and remote Scotland in, in particular. Um, Jonathan, do you? Yeah, j just to add, add to that point, um, I think there's been some concern around digital TV interference or the loss of digital TV services uh, as part of spectrum clearance programmes. Is, is that, that what you were referring to? Uh, I would refer to it, but I was meaning that there are lots of white areas where there is no signal uh, as of oh, today. Okay. Um, I'll also make the subsidiary point that uh, a lot of the slave masts uh, do not cover the full range of uh, channels that are available on the master masts. And I just wonder if Ofcom have a role, because these are differentially rural impact issues. Um, so, so, so the short answer to that is, is, is Matthew alluded to, there's a, a whole programme of spectrum clearance over the course of the next year, and you would expect to see um, particularly, again, 700 megahertz band, um, which is well suited to travelling over longer distances. So perhaps any of your constituents or people who are in areas that aren't currently receiving a digital TV signal may see improvements. And in fact, we, we trialled a, a clearance programme in Selkirk in the borders, which was um, and, successful. And, and indeed, increasing the signal strength. I mean, my signal, when it was analogue, was half a megawatt. Now it's digital, it's 800 kilowatts. I beg your pardon, it's eight kilowatts. Um, ergo, so, I get no digital signal. So, uh, again, by clearing uh, bands of spectrum that are particularly well suited to, right. to, to, to carrying TV this. signals. I, I, think, I think I'm going to leave that there because uh, 
as far as television goes, it, it stretches also into another committee. So <coughs> I, I, th I think we've had an answer there. If there's anything you want to add to that, of course, you can send it to the committee at uh, Clark's afterwards. John wants to come in very briefly, and then I'm going to yes, go to Going Jane. back to mobile phones, do, do you take an interest in um, the power supply for mobile phone masts? Because although the fat mast is there, if the, phone, if the power supply is not very secure, or if it fails, eh, that's a problem. And we talked about resilience earlier. Is that something that Ofcamp gets involved in? Uh, a yes or no answer would, would probably suffice on that. Jonathan, is that you? might actually have to refer that to my more technically minded colleague, Gary. Okay, <laughs> so Glenn shook his head, uh, Matthew didn't look the other way, so it's definitely you, Gary. It's not something we report on in Connected Nations at the moment, but it is something we've considered. Uh, obviously, the, the issue of mobile coverage in rural areas, there's, there's the issue, as you've correctly said, about uh, resilience of power supply, but also uh, cells in rural areas tend not to overlap. So if one becomes unavailable, then there's no service at all. So those, those two points are things that we've considered um, trying to factor in in some way to connected nations in future years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie, um, you've Just got a couple of think, questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief on this. I think we've covered uh, mobile considerably at various points. Um, is it possible that some parts of Scotland will, in effect, leapfrog 4G and, and go direct to having a provision of 5G services? Is, does that seem a, a, a likely possibility in, in Ofcom's eyes? Um, Gary, by a process of elimination. I, I, I don't think we will see <coughs> many parts of, of Scotland, or indeed the UK, avoid uh, or, or, or miss out on a 4G deployment and go straight to 5G. I, I think, uh, although as has as, been mentioned already, that the figures that we've quoted for mobile coverage in connected nations for Scotland, especially in terms of geographic area, are low. Uh, we will expect, given that data was collected in June last year, if we were to look at the situation today, things would have improved. So I would expect that there are certain parts of Scotland uh, that in connected nations we reported as being 4G not spots uh, through commercial rollout and, uh, and, and other activities. I would expect to see 4G in the next period uh, being deliverable to, to consumers. Uh, so I, I, th I think we will see uh, good coverage of 4G across Scotland before we start to see a 5G rollout. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan wants to come in very briefly just, on that. Just a very quick uh, supplementary point. Um, f 5G, um, I think it's important to just have on record that that's uh, particularly well suited to short distances. So it's, it's not the solution to, to rural connectivity as perhaps m many people think. Amy. Thank you. I'm happy to park that there. Um, uh, and finally, uh, we don't have a huge amount of time, unfortunately, to discuss it, but it is important that we touch on it, and that's uh, talking about access to much higher speeds, such as ultra-fast, um, or indeed um, full fibre services, fibre to the premise services. It's a very, very low percentage at the moment of premises which have FTTP 0.6%. Um, and even the disparity between 100 meg speeds upwards is, is hugely uh, different in rural to versus urban areas, specifically in urban areas where they have um, fibre cable as opposed to open route services. So um, I, I wondered if uh, anyone in the panel had a view on what could be done to improve access to those higher speeds or indeed ultra fast at 300 meg upwards or indeed one gig upwards, uh, you know, and especially with a focus on, on businesses and SMEs, because I think they'll more, more, more likely require those ultra high speeds. Um, Gary is, is, is indicating he wants to come in on that. So Gary, if I could bring you in, I'll, I'll try and bring you all in on this, but if I could encourage you to give a, a succinct answers, it would be great. Gary. I would pick up on the on the, the current situation. You, you, you quoted the figure from last year's Connected Nations. Uh, there's just an important point to note about uh, about that figure is that it it doesn't include uh, fibre to the premise availability for those services that, services that are only uh, de delivered to, to businesses. Connected Nations focuses on small businesses and consumers, so that figure would be higher for small business uh, small business premises. Uh, so. Uh, we would expect to report this year on a higher figure, but also um, some of those services <coughs> that currently are only available to businesses, we would expect in time those providers would open those services up to residences as well. 
Matthew, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, uh, very briefly indeed, just to add to that. I mean, I think we are, we are conscious that, you know, competition takes you so far. We are very aware of the, and encouraging of the need for investment in new technologies and new deployments as well. And I, I think, you know, particularly this year, we see ourselves, you know, not with the answers, but with a facilitation role, certainly. So, you know, there is an ambition to get the relevant people together. In fact, we're planning a, a particular conference on this matter in the, in the next quarter or so. Um, yeah, we're, we're all for it. Um, and I think, Glenn, you're going to get Very briefly, just one, on one supplementary on, on the point that Matthew just made about um, the conference that we're doing. So we uh, will ensure, or have already invited the Scottish Government uh, and industry representatives from Scotland uh, to participate in that, because we do think that infrastructure investment piece um, is, is going to be you know, the, the critical in allowing us to, to get to the kind of ultra, ultra high speeds that you've been talking about. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think that naturally brings... Uh, Stuart, um, we, ha we have time for a short question. Um, in your opening remarks, uh, Mr. Preston, you referred to postal services and surcharging, and we haven't otherwise covered that. Um, I, I just wonder, as a regulator, uh, what role you have in ensuring equity of access to particularly for parcels. Uh, but I also make it not simply in the delivery of parcels to premises in rural areas, but also the availability of pickup of parcels to be delivered to otherwise, because that's a vital service uh, for many micro businesses in rural areas. And I just wonder what the regulator is doing on that, because I think the, the whole issue of surcharge for delivery has become a very prominent one, which we'd like to hear from you on. Um, I'm just going to say, I'm, I, I think that that falls within all of our interests. I'm not sure it falls within our interests specifically as a committee, but we would like to hear the answer to that because it, it is a real issue across uh, some of the more remote areas of Scotland. So thank you, for Stuart, for bringing it up. And Jonathan, if you could give us an answer on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, so, yeah, firstly, it's, it's a very important issue. Um, charges should be clear up front to people as they go through the, the sales process. Um, on, on the regulation point, um, Ofcom... Uh, has powers uh, from the Postal Services Act. Uh, our powers are limited to the Royal Mail, and essentially it's about ensuring the safeguard of the universal service obligation. Um, on parcel surcharging, uh, it's, it's a very it's a complex issue. Uh, we have powers to request information from parcel operators. Um, we've published research on this in our annual monitoring report. Indeed, we, we wrote to, to Mr Rumbles about this um, sometime last year. Um, what that showed was that f four out of the five parcel operators that we requested information from applied surcharges. The, the other one being, the other one that wasn't, was, was Royal Mail. Um, it's important to note that there's no obligation on parcel, uh, sorry, retailers to use Royal Mail. Mm. They're, 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 it's a commercial decision to to uh, use other parcel operators, but it is quite concerning to, to see, obviously, the, 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 these, these higher charges. So in terms of what Ofcom has been doing, well, we've been engaged in a, a Mr Lockhead's uh, roundtable and contributed to his cam campaign. Um, we are all also giving evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee at Westminster, I think it, the, the 27th of February, so if you have an interest in that, I would, would urge you to, to, to keep tabs can on it. Can I invite uh, Mr Ruff to address the pick-up point as well? Because I think the focus has been on delivery up till now, but pick-up is narrower interest, but economically very important. Are, are you engaged on that? Jo Jonathan, I, I, I think if, I mean, I think you could acknowledge simply by saying that you think that's as much a problem as, as delivery charges, and that that would be acceptable. Oh, most definitely. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you. That that last point is important to a, to a huge amount of people across Scotland. I'd like to thank uh, Glenn, Gary, Jonathan, and, and Matthew for coming uh, in front of the committee today and giving evidence. It's been very helpful. Um, I'd now like to suspend the meeting briefly to allow the witnesses to depart, and I would ask committee members, if possible, to stay seated so we can move on to the next bit. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to move straight on to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation relating to animal feed. This is a consideration of a negative instrument concerning animal feed. No motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. The instrument breaches laying requirements. It comes into force early on the 6th of February 2018. This is the date required by European legislation which the instrument transposes. Is the committee agreed that it is contempt with the explanation given to the presiding officer for the breach? Are we agreed? We are agreed. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? That is agreed. That concludes uh, today's committee business and I now close the meeting. Please could the committee members remain in their seats.